Hi guys, Ronnie here and welcome to the workshop. Today I'm going to discuss a common topic on my channel that's chain boxing. Uh, after last video there have been a couple of questions that keep repeating and also I get them regularly from regular viewers. Uh, all kinds of questions regarding the boxing process, how to use the box chains, how to top them off, um, etc. So today I decided to put it all together in a cohesive package. I've done this before, but now I have a little bit more experience. The products have changed. There are some new options, so I'm going to talk you through that. So first, uh, what do you need uh, to wax your chain? Well, of course, you need uh, a chain or a couple of chains, ideally, if you want to run them in rotation. That's very beneficial in terms of wear and practicality, because uh, yes, it's a laborious process or can be compared to just regular drip loops, but that time is split uh, between different chains. So basically it takes the same amount of time to prepare 15 chains, like I'm doing now, it takes to prepare one chain. Uh, so that's something you need to keep in mind. Uh, then some other things you need, of course your preferred wax. Uh, this is a Silka Super Secret Chain Wax. Hot hot wax blend. Uh, I'm going to use this for the first time for, on half of the chains. Uh, on the other half I'm going to use uh, regular molten speed wax, the good old uh, tried and tested version which I have in the pot already. Um, then you need a couple of substances uh, to decrease the chain. Uh, the most obvious difference between a wax chain and an oil chain is that well, these two types of lubricants aren't compatible with each other. So you either just oil the chain or use the factory grease or just wax your chain. Uh, there is no middle ground in that. So before you do anything, uh, you need to remove uh, the factory grease from the chains themselves. Uh, that's very important because the wax can only stick to a clean metal surface. If you try to wax uh, a nasty oily chain or a factory greased chain, then it's not going to work, or at least not for very, very long and not very well. Uh, to do that, uh, you need a couple of household items, basically. So what I use uh, are jars from Nutrition Products. These are perfect because they're plastic, they're not, not going to break. They're reusable, they're washable and perfectly sealable. Uh, for that, uh, I use this kind of degreaser. It originally comes in parts washers and uh, or the parts washer that I use. It's biodegradable and it's a very, very strong degreaser. So I use that to strip off the majority of the grease. Now keep in mind that different chain brands uh, or the factory greases they come with are different. So the Shimano ones are fairly light, fairly easy to remove. Uh, then KMC, Campagnolo, YBN, um, that sort of stuff comes kind of in between. And there's this glue uh, that SRAM uses in that, that's just horrible and very hard to remove. Although the new axis chains have skipped that, so that's a step in the good direction. Uh, anyway, before any high performance use, you really want to remove all factory grease because it really is just good for packaging, nothing else. It, it attracts a lot of dirt, it has tons of friction initially, and then it just gets worse when you get all those contaminants uh, stuck into that. So yeah, uh, the greaser of your choice. Mine is this one, it works very well. Uh, Basically what I do is put some chains in here, as many as I can fit, then pour the degreaser over it, and leave it a little bit, then shake it, leave it again. I tend to leave it for an hour or two. You can't leave it overnight because uh, it can cause damage to your chain, uh, if, particularly with this uh, type of de degreaser. It's a chemical process that removes uh, hydrogen from the steel so that's not what you want it makes the steel brittle so the chain will be easy to break need to keep an eye on that uh, after you're done with this first soak uh, 
Uh, then is the part where you need to remove the degreaser residue. And for that I use ethanol or methylated spirit, however it is called, uh, in your area. Uh, this is just uh, to wash off the excess from this, uh, this type of stuff. Because as I said, the chain needs to be a clean sheet of metal. And if you leave this on, don't wash it off properly, then again, it's, the wax is not going to stick. Uh, my best option for all this, of this process would be brake cleaner, because it's almost as strong as this, but it doesn't leave any residue because it just evaporates. Uh, but unfortunately, I couldn't get, uh, or at least here I can't get um, brake cleaner in in this format and using aerosols at this scale is just not very clever. Okay, uh, this part governs basically the whole degreasing process. Uh, if you're done with that, then there are a couple of other things you need to know. So first, it's very practical uh, for chain waxing to use quick links on your chain. Basically, it's the only feasible way uh, to wax your chains because removing them and pre pressing them with a rivet link uh, all the time is, well, not that good for a chain because eventually you're going to run out of places that you haven't riveted yet because chains can last extremely long. So with this, you have the rivet link, uh, or sorry, the master link, and you just remove that. I get a lot of, the, lot of questions regarding reusability of these. Basically, every manufacturer will tell you that they, this is a single-use item. I, from my experience, know um, that then they can be safely reused a couple of times. I would say 10 to 15, um, depending on which type. It's not all that consistent. However, for an important event, I would definitely go with the new one for obvious reasons. Um, if you think about it, it can't really dislodge in any way under power, but if you try to shift under power, uh, that's really where a really worn out quick link can dislodge and this will break your chain and your race and possibly your face if this happens during a sprint. So keep an eye on that. Uh, these are not really expensive, you can get them in bulk packaging like this one is, contains 50 pairs. It's a big initial investment compared to a cost of a chain, but it will go a long way. Uh, then uh, to navigate opening and closing uh, quick links, uh, it's also worth to have a chain link tool or a master link plier, however you want to call it. It's a very simple device that you just use to press the links together. There are also other variants where you can also um, install them. So they work in the opposite direction as well. I don't find that necessary. These are very cheap, around 10 euros. So not a big deal. Uh, yeah, they said the boxes themselves. And then two additions. So on the left here, I have the Silka Super Secret chain loop. Uh, now, I said earlier that waxes and oils are not compatible. However, nowadays we have a selection of extremely good drip waxes, so waxes in a liquid, drippable format, that you can use for refills, so you don't need to rewax every time by removing a chain from the bike. And that can be extremely practical and it's something that I use myself. Uh, so right now I'm using Silka, as I explained in my previous video, not uh, so long ago. There are other options like Ceramic Speed UFO Drip version 2, Absolute Black Graphene Loop, Squirt Loop, Smooth. These really are the top options. Uh, some are better than the others. Uh, the main point, particularly with the Silka and Ceramic Speed version, is that they leave the chain um, as fast, as well lubricated, and uh, as clean as you would with a full immersive wax. And the difference is that this doesn't last as long as a full immersive wax. So uh, this brings the question, um, 
if you even need uh, to do a full immersive wax or what is the advantage uh, of going through all of this a couple of times well the initial preparation phase needs to be done whichever way you go uh, one thing you need to know that with the full immersive wax uh, as the name suggests uh, you immerse the chain fully into the hot wax and uh, this means that every square millimeter of every single component of the chain which there are many uh, gets covered uh, in a layer of solid wax now that is impossible you uh, using a drip loop so the first application ideally is always a hot wax bath after that if you just keep topping off with something like this it's uh, perfectly fine until you get to a wet or dirty ride or an event in those conditions because what happens is that dirt coming from your front wheel from the cranks from the water from the road gets pressed into the box that's already on your chain and this increases the abrasion uh, it traps some hard particles in the wax and on the chain which then abrades the metal away from the chain and that's uh, that's not very good it's not tragic it's still nowhere near as bad um, as you would get with an oiled or greasy chain um, because wax by itself when it's in solid state already applied to a bike it, it doesn't really attract much dirt but this way uh, by riding in dirty conditions and in the wet it can be forced uh, to can contain those uh, particles and if you then take this dirty chain it will not appear well it will not appear to be fully dirty or like with oil but if you put it again through an immersive waxing process the wax will basically wash it clean even if you don't do anything else to it and these contaminants will just uh, dissolve in the wax uh, that you're using of course they will remain in there but it's an extremely small amount so you would need to go through many many cycles of very dirty chains to actually degrade the quality of the wax by a significant margin of course uh, this is perfectly fine for training chains for competition if you want to go for the lowest possible friction available then obviously you won't contaminate your wax with uh, with dirty chains at all then you would first ultrasonically uh, clean your chain or in a hot water bath to flush out all the contaminants and then you would put put it in a clean state however for training uh, I don't do that for my chains or the chains of my clients I reserve that uh, for racing chains and specially prepared chains because it's just not cost effective and it doesn't the advantage you get there is really really slow however if you ride in the wet and then you just top up your chain with drip lube uh, then you're not really helping the situation because this tiny amount um, of wax that you drip on there will not clean the chain in the slightest uh, it will remain as dirty plus a little bit of clean wax on top so eventually your, if you keep repeating this process the friction will uh, gradually keep increasing until it's well quite high however it still won't be as high as with regular lubricants now exactly because of this reason my regime uh, with chains as it stands now is very simple I have a couple of chains, training chains, that I prepare in molten speed wax with the regular process. Then I put them on the bike and I use them and relube them with this until I hit wet conditions. Like I did this week, a lot, unfortunately. Then I take these chains and swap them in, in rotation with the new one, with the freshly waxed one. If I run out of those, I take all, I rewax them, and then again, as long as I'm in dry conditions, I just use this. 
and I found this to be quite cost effective and time efficient. And if I want a full on race chain, I would normally use a, a sealed ceramic speed UFO chain because I can't get anywhere near that prep level of preparation in here. But uh, I might be able to get quite close with a combination of molten speed wax in a clean, fresh state and some race powder, which I apply in this box or maybe the new Silka blend that contains um, this new tungsten desulfide uh, friction modifier which should make it maybe even faster. So that's what I'm going to try now. Uh, I'm going to show you also a bit of my cooking setup. Uh, so this is the pot I use, it's a um, Russell Hobbs slow cooker, it, it has this removable pan. As you can see I don't have a lot of wax in it. Uh, when I was starting out I tended to put a lot in there and then do multiple chains at once. Uh, but that's not really effective as, I, as it turned out. Now I just use a very small amount to cover just one chain, so in that thickness. And this way I can just freshen up the wax uh, more frequently. Uh, this is my training chain wax. Uh, it appears to be dirty, but it, actually it's not. It's quite fresh. It's just that if you stir it up, then this black layer in there, that's the, that's the molybdenum powder that's uh, in there. If you look at it more closely, you can see tiny metal particles in there. Maybe it's not visible in the video, but if I just use a magnet to fish them out, it's really visible. There it is. These are tiny pieces of metal uh, that the box flushes out of your chain uh, so they can't damage it anymore basically. This is why an immersive waxing process fully resets the chain. It cleans it, lubricates it and it covers every single part of it. So that's why it's so e effective at keeping your chain running for long. Okay, so that's the cooker that I use. Whichever model you have, it doesn't really matter as long as it doesn't heat too intensively. Uh, to set the box on fire. You have to be careful with that. A couple of things that I figure out. So these are my chains that I've just prepared. These are my training chains that I use on rotation. Uh, on my two bikes, these are all Durace chains. Uh, what you really want uh, when you ins insert uh, the chain in the box is to have it assigned some kind of wire. Uh, the best uh, in my experience is to just take some very cheap spokes and to bend them to this shape. Mm, this is really practical. Of course, Molten has a very nice tool for it. It's called the Swisher tool, which is nicer to use than this. But anyway, you can get away with spokes. I have a ton of these uh, prepared when I'm doing a lot of chains. As I said, this wax uh, is very slightly contaminated. Uh, that's why well, I've prepared this little canister. I'm going to pour it in. So this will be my training wax, as I've said here. I've put, I will put it in this little flexible uh, plastic thing, uh, just because then I can remove it, put the solid block back in there and reheat it again. Uh, when I remove this, I'm going to clean these metal particles, uh, clean up the crock pot, put in some fresh wax, and I'm going to prepare new chains uh, for clients which are over there. I've shown you these uh, previously. Uh, then another neat thing I have here is this little container. Uh, this as you can see is also marked. So the bike, so sorry, the chains that I pull from my bikes and need to be reboxed are put in here. 
then the ones that are fresh are in here so I know um, of course which one goes where and I have a separate one for the new chains that are prepared and ready for sale um, this is the molten speed powder that, that I use for race chains a bit of with left in there still and these are my remaining chain hangers again in a in a container so everything is um, fairly organized I would say and of course you need a bit of protection because the wax eventually will drip a little bit side to side so you don't want that uh, all over the place because sometimes it can be tricky to remove if, if it's in a thin layer uh, okay, so this is basically all the theory that you need to know. Now let's have a look at actually uh, doing this process from start to finish. I'm going to start, as I promised, with pouring off my training wax into this container. As you can see, it's fairly clear, and then there's the black part of it that's the molybdenum that tends to sit at the bottom that's really why you need to use the swisher tool so when you have the chain on there you can agitate it around so all the components get mixed up and hopefully in your chain okay with that done i'm going to clean this and then start Preparing the new chains, um, unpacking them is probably the most annoying process of these all, but yeah, let's start now. Now the cleaning stage for all the chains is completely finished. Uh, these are the last chains uh, that have been through the metallated spirit bath. So now they're perfectly clean and just need to dry. Uh, normally I would hang dry them like the other ones that are drying here because that's the quickest way to do it. But I just ran out of spokes. Uh, so they'll be here for now and the first part of the batch is already being waxed so uh, the first ones are actually drying right like this and i have one chain of course here in the fresh new wax uh, it's been sitting there for two or three minutes that's uh, pretty much all it needs now we're going to take it out i'm going to swirl it around a little bit as you can see the wax is nice and homogeneous right now so that's perfect and that's it couldn't be simpler really and on to the next one Of course we need to make sure that it's fully immersed like that and then it's just more of the same really this is most likely the simplest part of the whole process if your chain is then cold and dry with the wax settled in then it's ready to be installed on the bike okay so now that we have ready chains i'm going to show you how to put them on a bike it might be quite obvious for some 
but uh, I find a lot of misconceptions about this on the internet. So this is the chain that we have with the wax on it. Uh, as you will experience, um, it's quite stiff because the wax on there turned solid as it cooled down. Uh, one other trick that I have, because these are chains for different bikes, how do I know which one is which? Well, I know that I threaded this one, or the TT bikes chains on this type uh, of Swisher and the regular ones are the ones for the road bikes. So if you can differentiate them in some way before just throwing them in the wax, uh, that will help you and save a bit of headache. So you just unthread it like this. Uh, Molten Speed Wax recommend to now take a piece of plastic tubing and to wrestle your chain around it uh, so you break these bonds in each individual link. And uh, honestly for training chains or any chain for that matter I don't think it's really necessary because if you just put it on the bike and cycle it a couple of times being careful that the chain will not derail itself just trying to push it on you do a couple of rotations and then it breaks up anyway of course when you're riding the moment you start to apply a bit of power to it it will just loosen up um, for racing chains uh, ideally you want a bit of braking period before actually going to the start line and applying the molten uh, speed wax race powder as well uh, but this video is getting long enough already, so you'll take care of that in a separate episode. So let's just put the chain on the bike and you'll see how it works. Now normally you don't need a work stand to do this, but since I didn't break up my chain, it will be much easier if I can just pedal it around. So. And then it will break those wax bonds off and if you take the net time with all of these takes then I think or at least in my experience this is the quickest way actually because the chain is quite solid it's fairly easy to thread on This bike has synchro shift enabled on it, so it's a bit trickier with the cog alignment at the rear, but it's not really that important at this stage. I often see people putting on their quickling the wrong way around. They have a little marking on there uh, with the arrow. The thing you need to realize is that when you're pedaling, the chain goes that way so the arrow needs to go that way too uh, yeah when i say i saw a lot of people doing it wrong i never saw it undo itself uh, for that reason so probably not catastrophic but there's probably a good reason why it's designed in that way so let's just use it that way There we have it, you need to have the link in the upper span. Then I just put the rear brake on, apply a bit of force, uh, there it goes. Now there's a front mech on there right now, so the chain will usually not tend to derail. When you have a one by setup you need to be a little, a little bit more careful. As you see, as I shift through the gears, the excess wax is breaks off and the chain starts to move slowly. Ok, 
Okay, uh, that's about it. Waxing process, start to finish. Everything you need to know. So I hope you have found this useful and informational and it will convince you to go and bin all those nasty oils that you've used so far. Because really, it just requires a bit of common sense, a bit of knowledge. If you're not prepared to go uh, through all of this hassle, then we do sell uh, the pre-prepped chains as I've explained already. Uh, the processes that go, that go in there and after that you're left with a drip loop that you can reapply for a really long period of time and your chain will still be very good. I would say 98 or 99% of that level that you get with the regular reboxing. Okay, so that's uh, all about boxing today. Thanks for watching and see you next time.